Montclair, uh, please turn with us to the book of John and the fourth chapter. John chapter 4, a passage of scripture that we've preached on many times throughout the years, and once again it's come to our heart this evening, John chapter 4. And before we get started, we want to open up with a word of prayer. Lord, as we come to you, God, we open up the word of life, Lord, we just pray that you would help us, God, give us understanding, guide us, Lord, give us strength, Father, we pray, uh, Lord, may the, the things that all of us here need tonight, may we receive it of the word, God, most of all, if there be one with us, Lord, who doesn't know you, we just pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would draw them, and God, they would understand your love for them, Lord, that Christ died for them, and the Lord, they could be saved, they would just but come to you, it's in Jesus' name we pray. And amen. All these years now of being a Christian and um, and being a preacher, I've been saved, I think, uh, this year will be 20 years, and I think 18 of those years, I think I've been preaching now. And one thing that never gets old to talk about and to think upon and to study upon is the great love of God and how that God seeks out the sinner to save them. This story in John chapter 4 is one of those stories, how that the Lord will come to the sinner, and he comes to them in the midst of their need. And so here in John chapter 4, we will see a lady uh, who probably thinks she's not worth a lot. She's messed up her life, as we will see here. She's ashamed of her life. Many others around her do not like her, and yet the God of everything takes the time to come to her to save her soul. And it's like that with everyone, I think. I don't think that there will be a person who will leave this world, who will at some point in time not have the voice of the Lord Jesus speak to their heart, drawing them to Him. Jesus said very plainly that He came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He said in another place, He says, They that are whole need not a physician. But they that are sick, and you know, in thinking about that and in thinking about a church, what is a church? It is really a group of imperfect people who gather together to worship a perfect God. We are all on this journey seeking to grow more and more and seeking to love this Savior who loves us sinners. And so here in John chapter 4, starting at the first verse, the Bible says this, When therefore the Lord knew how... The Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples. He left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And the Bible says this, and he must needs go through Samaria. Let us stop reading right there for just a moment. The first thing that jumps out of us, uh, jumps out at us at this uh, point in the scriptures is the fourth verse. He must needs go through Samaria. Now, just in case you're not aware, let's talk a little bit about the history of Jewish people and Samaritan people. Samaritan people were once full-blooded Jewish people, but they intermarried, as it were, and those who were considered to be a full-blooded Israelite or full-blooded Jewish person, that is, they did not marry outside of the nation of Israel, those people looked down upon the Samaritan people. After all, they had sinned. They had. There's, there's no doubt about that. God told them not to marry outside of their nation, and they did. And so those who were considered to be a full-blooded Jewish person of the nation of Israel, they looked down upon the Samaritan people. They hated them. And just to put it bluntly, they were racist against them. They considered them to be dogs. They did not like them whatsoever. And so to see that it says... Jesus, a Jewish man, must needs go through Samaria. We need to pause there and think for just a moment and, and look at what tradition tells us. The journey that Jewish people would take, even if it would cut miles off their journey, even if it would cut hours off of their journey, they wouldn't go through Samaria to get to where they needed to go. They would go all the way around it because they hated the Samaritan people. But Jesus was not concerned with tradition, nor was he concerned with what other people thought. He was concerned about this woman he knew he would be meeting at the well. And let us stop and add something to this message while we're thinking about it. 
It need not concern us what other people think about us. We need to be His and be led by Him. Jesus, as He said in His own words, He did not do as He thought. He followed the leading of God the Father in His life. He did the things that He heard He must do, is what He said in the Scriptures. And so there was a need for Him to go through Samaria. He did not care about the social connotations of the time. He did not care about the traditions that the other Jewish people held, nor did he care what anyone would think of him as he traveled through Samaria. There was a woman there that was lost, a woman there that was unsaved, a woman there that thought she was worthless. And other people thought she was worthless too, just to put it plainly. And so he had a need to go there because he is the great physician. Not only of the body and of the mind, but of the soul. He is the one that could go and give her the hope that she needed in her life. And so, it says, Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now it says, Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. This was... Around noon, maybe a little afternoon. Now, the reason that that is important is because we are going to see this woman coming to the well at this time. And this scripture gives us indication about what others thought of her, but not only about what others thought of her, about what she thought about herself and the mistakes that she has made in her life. The sixth hour would have been roughly the hottest portion of the day. This was not traditionally the time to go and draw water from the well. But this was the time of day that she chose to draw water from the well. Why? This was the time no one else would be there. She didn't want to go there when the other women were there. See, traditionally speaking, the women would usually go and draw the water out of the well. She didn't want to be there when the other women were there. She knew what they thought of her. And apparently it bothered her. And maybe she believed it about herself as well. Because you see, when, when someone thinks something about you, if you don't really care what you think, what they think, you go and do whatever regardless. Because you don't really care what they think. You don't believe what they think about you. You know whatever it is they think about you isn't true. So it doesn't bother you, but... Apparently it bothered this woman. Apparently maybe she believed it as well. And so Jesus is there. He knew she would be there at this time. This was a divine appointment. And listen to me very plainly. Uh, I don't know where any of us are in our lives right now. But it's, it's not a mistake when the Lord comes speaking to you and meeting you right where you are in your life. It is a divine appointment without question. And so, it says, There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus saith unto her in the seventh verse, Give me to drink. The disciples, it says, They were gone away unto the city to buy meat. And so, Jesus here, this woman, they had never met before. Apparently, for whatever reason, I don't know if it was his accent, don't know if it was the way he was dressed, don't know if it was perhaps the way he looked. Perhaps maybe the facial features and the tint of his skin gave it away, but she recognized that he was a Jewish man. And so she said to him in the ninth verse, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. So she knew what the Jewish people thought of her. And it was also very uncommon for a man to speak to a woman. And so she's a little bit puzzled by this. She's, I think we can probably see there's a little bit of a defensive tone to uh, the way she is speaking here. And Jesus doesn't waste any time getting down to why he is there. Much like when Nicodemus came to Jesus by night in the third chapter. I've often wondered why is it that Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and he came alone? And there's many different reasons a person could think of. Did he come to Nicodemus at night alone 
because he didn't want anyone else to see. Perhaps he didn't want the other Pharisees to know that he was coming to talk to this man named Jesus from Nazareth. Maybe he came to Jesus by night, and I like to think of it like this. Perhaps he began to question everything the Pharisees had, had been saying. Perhaps he began to wonder, is this man the Savior? We don't know. Perhaps, as like the old-time preachers used to say, perhaps he was under conviction. Perhaps the bed was too hard, the covers were too short. The water didn't quench his thirst. The food didn't taste good. Perhaps that was the problem. We don't know. But he came to Jesus with great flattering words. He says, we know that thou art a teacher from God. For no man can do the miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus didn't pay no attention to the flattering words that Nicodemus had. He got right down to the point. He said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Here, this woman's a little bit of maybe defensive, asking a question, why would you, you're a Jewish man, you don't have dealings with Samaritans, why are you asking a drink from me? And Jesus' response was getting down to business. If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. See, he got down to business real quick. With Nicodemus, he said, you must be born again. With this woman, he said, you should have known who I was. If you had known, you would have asked, and I would have given you living water. Now the woman, she says, sir, thou hast nothing to draw with. The well was deep. From whence then hast thou this living water? I don't know if she was being serious. I don't know if she was maybe being a little sarcastic. You can kind of read it both ways. But I think she understood a little bit about what Jesus was saying. She understood there was some spiritual meaning there. And when you begin to talk to people about Jesus, you will get a response, a visceral response from people. It will either be joy because they know him, or they will start to get on the defensive. Because they know that they're not right with him. And this woman, she begins to pull out some religion. She begins to pull that out. And so she asked him in the 12th verse, Well, art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Little did she know she was talking to the very one that wrestled with Jacob in the Old Testament. But notice what she did here. She said, our father Jacob, she wanted to invoke one of the Old Testament patriarchs, just as the Jewish people of the day. They would say, well, our father Abraham or our father Moses. Where is God in it? You see, they wanted to talk about pedigrees. They wanted to talk about genealogies. And they were trusting in these people. And the reason I bring that up is because it is the same thing that people do today. Human nature has not changed. You go back to the fall in Genesis. When God came looking for Adam and Eve, the scripture tells us that he called out to them. He said, Adam, where art thou? Why did God do that? If he's an all-knowing God, why did he call out to Adam and say, Adam, where art thou? It wasn't because God didn't know where Adam was. It was because God needed to show Adam that in Adam's lost estate, he was still looking for him and caring about him. All throughout the Bible and all throughout human history, the lost nature of man hasn't changed. And so she brings out this religion, and a lot of people do that. A lot of people, when you begin to talk to them about their soul, they'll bring up their mom or their dad or their husband, their wife, their grandparents, their family, the church that they attend. And when I say attend in quotations, I'm talking about Christmas, Easter. I was at the nursing home uh, one time getting ready to have church there. And one of the residents spoke to one of the nurses who was getting off work and said, um, you should stay. You should stay and, and, and be in church with us. She said, oh, honey, I go to church. She said, oh, where do you go to church at? She said, LaGrange. Now, mind you, I've pastored LaGrange for a few years. Now, I've not ever seen this woman there. People pull anything out any time. They'll pull anything out. She was wanting to pull out all this stuff. Well, are you greater than our father Jacob? 
the Pharisees. Well, we have Moses as our father. We have Abraham as our father. Listen to me. When you and I stand before God one day, and I use the word stand as a euphemism because none of us will stand. We will all be on our knees. It will not matter what my wife has done. It will not matter what my mom and dad has done. It will not matter what my grandparents has done. The only thing that will matter will be the same question that Jesus posed to the disciples. Jesus came to the disciples one time and he says, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Well, some say that you're Elijah. Some say that you're that prophet. And when you go out to the world, you'll get many different takes on who Jesus is. But the question that really matters was the next question Jesus asked the disciples. He says, Who do you say? Who do you say that I am? And your answer to that question will dictate what God's answer is when you are before Him. Whether or not you will hear the words, Enter in, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many. Or whether or not you hear the words, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. And so she brings up about Jacob. So Jesus gets a little more plain with her. He says, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. You know, I have said so many times, and, and it bears saying again, though, why is it that you see people who have stayed on this road for 70 years, 80 years, and they still love to hear the gospel. Why is it that people in the midst of great turmoil and great problems in their life can still praise God? I haven't talked about this video for a while, but there's a video that I've watched before of a man who he wanted to make this video. He was diagnosed with cancer, I think pancreatic cancer, prostate cancer, I don't remember which. He was diagnosed in the fall. And so he wanted to make a video and put it on YouTube, and he did. And it, it showed him he was probably in his 50s. He was a very healthy-looking man, a very strong-looking man. And it showed pictures of him during that time when he was first diagnosed. And then it showed pictures of him a few months later, and he didn't even look like the same man anymore. They had a hospital bed in his living room, and he was basically skin and bone. He was at the very end of his life, and yet at the very end of his life, in that video, he lifted up his hands and gave praise unto the massacre. You say, how can that be? He told people in his video testimonial, he says, don't blame God for this. He says, this is just a result of sin in the world. He said, God is good. And he said, the advice I have for anyone in this world is, he says, seek after him and go after him hard. How can a man in his 50s, who just a few months ago was probably 210, 220 pounds, wasted away down to probably 130 pounds, how can there still be that outlook in him? Because he met the one who gives a well of water in the soul that springs up into everlasting life. I've said this, I don't know how many times we've said it Sunday, and as the years go on, we will still be preaching this very same thing. I can promise you, you do not know what life is all about until you know the one who made you. You will never understand what life is about. You will never have that void filled within your soul. And so he told her this. The woman said, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Again, that statement that she made in the 15th verse, I don't know, I don't know if she was serious or, she, again, she was being sarcastic. One has to wonder, knowing what we know about her and what we're about to see, knowing how she no doubt felt about herself and how others felt about her. And so Jesus got down once again to the nitty-gritty with her. He got down to her sin. And the fact of the matter is this, is that all of us here, if you're here and you're saved, you're here and you're lost, the fact of the matter is this, we have all at times made a mess of our lives. We have all, I, I cannot recall and tell you how many times 
I've come to God and say, God, I've done the same thing again. We've all made a mess of things. We've all screwed things up. And so Jesus gets down to business with her. He says, go, call thy husband and come hither. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that saidest thou truly. He got down to what was really happening and happened in her life. Why she went to the well at the hottest point in the day when no one else would be there. Max Licato in his book, I can't remember uh, which one it was. I think it was God Came Near. He wrote about this and he said he wonders, and again it's just using his imagination, he wonders if perhaps he didn't see with this woman at the well, perhaps as she came, there was five little children with her, with five different faces, signifying the five different husbands. We don't know. But what we can see from all this is the main purpose of this message tonight. She had had multiple relationships that had not worked out for whatever reason. She was ashamed of it. That is her story. What is your story? What is my story? It might be different. But the fact of the matter is this, is that we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We have all made huge mistakes in our life. We've probably all done things that we didn't mean to do, but still yet we did them. There's no getting around it. And the sin in our lives must be dealt with. It must be repented of. It must be turned away from there's things we've all done that there's no going back. There's no changing. There are things that I can look back from my teenage years and still the things that I've done and said that still haunt me. I can't change them. They're there. But the thing is, and here's the beautiful thing, is I've been forgiven of them. And that's what Jesus is trying to bring to this woman here. He's trying to bring forgiveness to her. He's trying to bring a new life to her. He's trying to bring a well of water springing up within her soul to her. And so he has to bring up her sin because the sin must be dealt with. Listen, you can carry your sin around all you want or you can leave it at the cross of Calvary. That goes for saved and lost people alike. Because a lot of times as Christians what we do is we get saved, we get forgiven, we make a mistake, we ask God to forgive us, but then we pick the guilt and shame of that sin up with us and we start carrying it again. Listen, the cross is the answer to our sin. It's the answer to man's malady, as Ravi Zacharias used to say. And so, as Jesus said this, the woman said, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. I can't help but wonder as I read that, I wonder if she turned her head and a tear ran down her face as that was her response because Jesus knew. You know, none of us are hiding anything really. He knew what was going on in her life. And I have often said this throughout the years. You know, there's things that I can hide from you. I'm not perfect. There's things I can hide from my wife. And vice versa. You can hide things from a pastor, you can hide things from a spouse, from your children, from the people you go to church with. You can hide all kinds of stuff. I can hide all kinds of stuff. But the fact is that all things are open under the eyes of Him with whom we have to do, as the book of Hebrews says. There's no getting around that. And so, you might as well come clean with Him. And so this woman, in one final attempt to try to Make an excuse of things. She wants to talk about where people worship now. You know, when you talk to someone who's lost or someone who is not where they ought to be in their Christian life, you will find excuse after excuse after excuse of why things are the way they are in their life and why they don't go to church like they ought to or why they're not saved. And people will come up with excuse after excuse. Well, you know what? So-and-so at this church 10 years ago did this to me. And you know what? If they're going to heaven, so am I. I got news for you. No one said they're going to heaven. You don't know their heart. The only one you can truly know about is yourself. 
This woman here, she says, Well, our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. She wanted to talk about where, where should we worship. Jesus is trying to get through to her heart. She wants to know well, where should we worship. And so Jesus said these words to her woman. Believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. And he's correct. For a person to be considered a, a, a we call them Christian now, but to be righteous in the eyes of God in the Old Testament, they had to obviously believe in the promise of the coming Messiah, but they would also have to uh, proselytize into the Jewish faith and become an Israelite. And Jesus was correct, but you see, times are about to change, and that's what he's getting through to her. And so he says, but the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. What is Jesus trying to get down and say to this woman? He is trying to let her know, it's not about Jacob, it's not about Abraham, it's not about Moses, nor is it about the mountain. It is about you coming to grips with your sin, turning from that sin. Listen, when he told her that those that worship the Father must worship him in spirit and in truth, what is he saying? He is saying in a nutshell, you must be genuine. Come to God with all that you have and all your baggage and worship him from the heart. It's not about the religion. It's not about where you are. It's not about any of those things. It's about coming to God with who you are, all of your sin, letting Him take care of that sin, and letting Him save you. And she says, well, I know that when the Messiah comes, which is called Christ, He will tell us all things. And Jesus, she, she was on the right track now. She was beginning to suspect, I think. And Jesus said, I that speak unto thee and he. The word Messiah and Christ, it means Savior. And that's what everyone needs, a Savior. A Savior for the mess that they've made in their lives. A Savior for the problems that they continue to make even after they're saved. As I have said, uh, and, and this phrase has been used many times as we come to a close and as we ask Sister Miller to come, this phrase has been used many times. What is a church? A church is simply a spiritual hospital. It's a place where people come and get saved. It's a place where Christians come and continuously get right. That's all it is. God wants, you know, this woman thought no one wanted her. Husband after husband, five times. The man she was now with, I'm assuming she said, you know what, I'm not getting married this time because this one probably won't last. She went to the well because her opinion of her amongst the other people wasn't very good. And she probably thought no one wanted her. There's a lot of people in this world that thinks no one wants them. And you know what? They might be right. There might not be any people in this world that want them. But the most important one that counts the most does want you. It's evidenced here as he came to this woman at the well. He must needs go through Samaria. He came to this woman because he loved her. And he has a love for all sinners. All sinners everywhere. There is not a person in this world that Jesus cannot save. Nor is there a Christian in this world who has messed things up so bad that he can't get them on the right path just like that. As we stand, what number do you have?